Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the new world of work. My name is Kat Breet, and I am here every Tuesday and Thursday to help you figure out how to get more money, freedom, and fun out of work. One of the biggest barriers to money, freedom, and fun and success at work is this little thing called stress. And I am so excited to have a special guest today, Kit Welchlin, who has been teaching seminars on stress for 20 years. Let me tell you a little bit about Kit Welchin before I bring him on this morning. So Kit began speaking, listen to this. He began speaking at the age of nine in 4-H. By 16, he was organizing and facilitating presentations on leadership. Let me say that again, by 16, he was organizing presentations and facilitating them on leadership, citizenship, community service, and motivation for both the 4-H Club and Future Farmers of America. He's got a BS in speech communication. He's got a master's degree in speech communication, but he's not just a phenomenal crowd-pleasing speaker. There's something else that's a fun fact. He purchased his very first manufacturing company at the age of 21. And by the age of 26, he was the CEO of not one, but three companies. So he actually really understands business top to bottom. Um, so he's spoken all over the world. He's given over 3000 presentations to more than 500,000 people. And Kit has agreed to come on and share his wit and his wisdom with you this morning. So good morning, Kit, and welcome. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kat, for that flattering introduction. My goodness, after after an introduction like that, I, I can't, can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> well, it's great to have you. And so, wow, 2020, what a year. Yeah, this one has been a little bit unusual. You know, I started speaking for a living back in 1991. And then when Y2K was coming, people were quite concerned of what was going to happen. And not much came out of that. But then 9-11 occurred and had quite an impact on my business and everybody else's too for a year or two. And then, of course, the recession in 2008 kind of took our breath away for a year or two. And now we're dealing with a pandemic. So it seems like every 10 years or so, something's going on that can really put us on our heels and cause a tremendous amount of stress. It can. And you've um, you've got a series called Seminars on Stress. And so, you you know, you really you've been guiding people through this. And so I'm just thrilled to get your insights today. First of all, what are you seeing right now that's maybe a little bit different than what you've seen through some other really tough times? Well, the thing that I find that's putting the most pressure on people today is the, the new technologies. Usually we have a year or two or maybe a decade to prepare for big technological advances, but really it was shoved on us pretty quickly, almost overnight with the pandemic where one day we were going to work and we we're completely competent and confident and now we're staying at home and kids are at home and our work and life balance is out of control and everything that we had for a routine, uh, kind of the apple cart had been turned over. and trying to figure out how do we manage this new balance in our lives. So I think with the technology of how now today we're working together on StreamYard, but you know, if you would have told me six months ago as a professional speaker that I didn't really need to worry about the lighting and the sound on a stage with hundreds of people in the audience that really I needed to be prepared to work with a half a dozen different platforms whether it's Skype or Google Meet or GoToWebinar or GoToMeeting or Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams or StreamYard, I would have said six months ago, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I have no interest. It isn't something that I would want to do. So I think this technological push that has been placed upon us has really boosted the amount of stress that we feel personally and professionally. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, some of the biggest triggers for stress, as you know, you've been studying it for 20 years, are change and uncertainty. Uh, change on the technology front, the work style, just change, 24-7 change, upheaval every in every aspect of our lives, and the uncertainty. Um, so the question is, how can every one of us get out of bed in the morning and manage this really large burden of stress? Um, where do you like to start when you step up on a platform or on a webinar and talk about this topic of stress? 
Well, you know, I've delivered hundreds of seminars on stress. And sometimes when I'm delivering that presentation, I'm thinking to myself, wow, did I ever, re did I ever need this? It is a daily battle. And one of the ways that I like to approach it is there's three questions we need to ask ourselves. And one is how well am I going to avoid unnecessary stress? How well am I going to respond to unavoidable stress? And how can I practice good health? So how well can I avoid unnecessary stress is to really take a look at your day and think about who are the individuals, what are going to be the issues that are going to be discussed that maybe I can sidestep, or maybe it's something that I could send an email rather than have a face-to-face -face interaction about. Or maybe it's something that I could delegate to somebody else that they may enjoy that I really don't like doing. But if we can figure out a certain amount of our day that we can avoid unnecessary stress, that's a good start. And then to take a look at that schedule and think about those personal and professional activities where you can't avoid them and you're going to have to be prepared to respond appropriately. So we need to really understand our emotions. We need to understand our triggers and we need to have a long list of stress management techniques that we can access, whether they're physical or psychological, to manage the stress. So we can be cool, calm and collected in those difficult conversation or stressful activities. And then practicing good health. We wanna make sure we're well-fed, well-rested and well-exercised. And if we feel good, I think we can absorb a lot more of the stress that we have in our lives. So if I heard you correctly, there's sort of three things to think about. First of all, are you doing a good job of avoiding unnecessary stress? I wanna come back to that in a second. <laughs> Number two, you know, are you managing the stress that that you can't avoid. And then number three, just practicing good things like eating and sleeping and, and exercise and things like that. But let's get back to the avoiding unnecessary stress. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, sometimes if you know, I'm sure many people have taken personality type indicators. The one I really enjoy is the type A, type B personality type indicator, where you have this whole range of behavior where you could be highly competitive or more cooperative, where you must finish things once you start them versus leaving things a little bit unfinished. But how much pressure are we putting on ourselves? So it's kind of a self-assessment of how well can we maybe prepare ourselves to avoid uh, feeling that stress or that pressure. But also, if we take a look at there's certain individuals that we interact with, uh, I used to say for years, you know, really take a month off, take a month off from family and friends and, and really examine who's supporting you and who's distorting you. I have three older brothers, two of them I get along quite well with, one not so much. And if I know that in advance, I can maybe think about how I'm going to choreograph the family events and to be you know, civil, to be kind, to be nice, but not to get into any sort of an argument or discussion that could enhance, not only not enhance, but increase my stress and everybody else sitting around the table. So a part of it is thinking about the issues, thinking about the activities, the situations that can cause you stress and those triggers. And is there a way that I can figure out a strategy to at least minimize the damage, if not completely avoid it? Wonderful. So my goodness, I've... Um had to do that a lot over the years, you know, especially when it comes to times in my life where during the Great Recession, I had two kids in diapers. I had a mother who was dying, a dad who had a massive stroke and he was bedridden. And I just, you know, I had some friends that that just didn't understand. They hadn't been through it. And I had one particularly demanding friend who actually said to me, she said, you know, Catherine, I need a friend who is going to talk to me at least once a week. And I had to say to her, I, I, I'm so sorry. My children are barely seeing me right now. And my husband, I can't, I can't do that. Um, so she broke up with me and yeah. <laughs> that's okay. You know, I was sad and I thought seriously. And then I thought, Phew. you know, I just, I, I didn't have room uh, for that. So. And you um, can imagine now with a pandemic, how everyone in our lives have a different combination of stressors and, Many of the people that we may have had as a kind of a support or we could call out to that would be a little bit lighthearted to pick us up psychologically throughout the day, they're drained. So I think everybody, whether it's the personal or professional responsibilities and all of those changes that have occurred in their lives, I think everyone's kind of running on empty as far as having that extra emotional energy to absorb other people's concerns and, and stressors. You know, there is a thing called compassion fatigue, which if you take on everybody else's problems and crises or try to support them all the time and not take care of yourself first, you'll go underwater. It'll be very difficult for you 
to manage the stress in your life and not have a negative impact on the ones you love and care about. Do you mean like starting live shows five days a week when COVID hit and we did it for three months straight and I crashed one Saturday, I just crashed. And my husband said, maybe we should pull those live shows back to twice a week. So, um, you know, <laughs> you I wish I a good it. point. You bring up a good point. You know, there's three stages of stress that can lead to burnout if we aren't really paying attention. The first stage of stress is the alarm stage. And of course, the pandemic, things are shutting down, stay at home orders, those sort of things happen overnight, takes our breath away. So we become alarmed. And then that's our response, that old fight or flight mechanism that we inherited from our ancestors 50, 60,000 years ago kicks in. And no matter how well or how poorly our day goes, we're exhausted. But if we don't recognize those signals early, we become burned out. First stage of burnout is physical fatigue. Like you say, you just hit the wall. You just are exhausted. It's when you turn on the TV to watch your favorite TV program. And the next thing you know, you you wake up, it's 1.30 in the morning, there's an infomercial on selling exercise equipment, then you find your remote control and you shut off the TV and head down the hallway to get a few more hours of sleep. Or the psychological fatigue of burnout where uh, you get touchy or you uh, get grumpy or grouchy or some people go looking for a fight, some people withdraw from relationships, but almost every one of us suffer from something called mindlessness or thoughtlessness. You're on your way home and you think, oh, that's right, I need to pick up a gallon of milk. And the next thing you realize, you pull up in front of your garage and doggone it, I didn't pick up any milk. So then you head down to the grocery store. Then the next thing you find yourself doing is walking up and down the aisles of the grocery store, trying to figure out why am I in a grocery store? And so you grab some paper towels, they never go bad. Grab some toilet paper, can always use that and get up in the checkout line and you look in somebody else's cart and they have milk. So you go back to the far corner of the store and walk out with your milk and $20 of other grocery items. And the next thing you realize you're pulling back into the parking lot at, at work and you're on your way home. And so that mindlessness and thoughtlessness can, you know, lead to injury or accidents or getting hurt. And then the last stage of burnout is spiritual fatigue, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, thoughts of escape. Don't feel competent on the job anymore. Don't want to deal with your clients anymore. You're just sick of it. And you watch a TV show about people that have run away from, you know, for five or 10 years and none of their family and friends can find them. And you're, and you're wondering if you could do that, if you could just run away for five years. You know? And so we should be able to see these yellow lights and red lights going off like a dash of a car that you know, there's something wrong, not my neck, headache in my left temple, getting grumpy, getting grouchy, hanging up on people. And then, you know, if I have a real bad week, you know, you know, just uh, shutting down, closing the drapes and not taking any phone calls. So there's a lot of signals. We just need to be aware of them. But you know what? If you truly do become burned out, I came across a study that claims it takes two to four years to recover from burnout. And I've never had anybody ever come up to me and say, oh, Kit, years I was burned out. Those are the best years of my life. No, they're the longest days of our lives. And I don't want you to miss out on the best two to four years of your life with your kids or your parents or your spouse. So we really need to get a handle on it. We really need to have a long list of strategies to implement. Well, and I know somebody who happens to have a long list of strategies for managing stress. So talk a little bit about your 30 tricks to taming the beast. Yeah, you know, stress is a physical state. It's also a psychological state. Physically, we get tired. Psychologically, we tend to worry. I came across a study by the Nightingale Foundation that claimed that 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. 30% of what we worry about already has happened. We just haven't accepted it. 12% uh, of what we worry about are needless healthcare concerns. Am I going to get heart disease like my dad, cancer like my mom? All you can be is well-fed, well-rested, well-exercised. Rest is fate. 10% of what we worry about is petty. That's the day we don't like how our hair looks. Isn't that funny? That's the day we get the most compliments about our hair. Oh, your hair looks really nice today. Really, I thought about shaving it all off before I came to work. No, it looks great. Yeah, crazy, you know. So that leaves a whopping 8%. 8% of what we worry about, oh, you know, we should be worried about. The problem is trying to figure out which 8% that is. So Mark Twain used to put it this way. Imagine 10 troubles rolling down the road at you like tires. Can you imagine that? 10 troubles rolling down the road at you like tires. Probably nine will roll in the ditch before they ever get to you. We tend to worry about a lot of things that simply never happen. So we have to have some physical remedies. We have to have some psychological strategies. So one of the physical things I ask people to do is to get organized. And I don't know if that's going to take two hours or two days or two weeks, uh, but 
we spend 45 minutes a day, personally and professionally combined, just looking for things. So we want to make sure we get organized. What did our parents used to say? A place for everything and everything in its place. Awfully good advice. Also, you want to make sure that you exercise. And there's five criteria to an exercise program that will work if you put it to work. Number one is it has to be something that causes you to move. That's real important in an exercise program. It has to be something that causes you to breathe deeply so you get the aerobic benefit. Something that causes you to bend, to put elasticity back into the muscles and ligaments. It has to be something you enjoy and it's at your pace. I'm not going to ask you to get up every morning and run three miles. I have a brother that does. I'll run if I'm real scared, but I don't run for exercise. <laughs> I, I tend to go for walks. And sometimes I'll take our oldest daughter dog, you know, that dog for a walk. It's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. It's kind of expressionless. So great audience to try new material on. But you have to figure out some physical remedies, whether it's exercise or massage or relaxation exercises. The number one strategy of Fortune 500 company executives is to have a hobby. The key, though, is to make sure the hobby is significantly different than what you do on the job. So when things aren't going well at work, you can fall back on a different self-concept, still like yourself personally, even if things are kind of bumpy professionally. So, But make sure it's a hobby that's safe, one that can't kill you. Uh, use music or uh, to your advantage rather than your sing if you have a good voice or if you drive alone. You know. But we also need those psychological strategies. Uh, positive visualization. Uh, I came across a study one time that claimed that human beings are successful 95% of the time. 19 out of 20 times that you attempt in your life, you do attain. Can you imagine running to the casino where 19 out of 20 times you pull down the one arm bandit or hit the buttons and pay out? That's the return we get on the investment with ourselves. So today, you know, with our presentation or the live show, this is the first time I've ever been on StreamYard. So what I told myself for the last couple of days was this. Kit, 19 out of 20 times what people attempt, they do attain. And just reminding myself of that, they this gave us a 95% chance it was going to go smoothly. And I felt more comfortable because of that. And then positive affirmations, paying yourself a compliment when nobody else is. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. You keep saying things like that, you'll be a U.S. senator someday. <laughs> <laughs> but between positive visualization and uh, positive affirmations, you know, we can really... Uh, uh, take care of our own morale, manage our own morale so we can absorb the shock of stress more easily. We can. I'm, I'm just laughing. You know, you just keep firing off all sorts of uh, memories and, and thoughts for me. But um, the hobby thing, by the way, um, I love scuba diving and I can dive that way, but I do mitigate my risks. So hopefully that hobby is is okay and appropriate. But um, Oh yeah, scuba diving is great. You know, the one thing I love about scuba diving, it's a thinking sport. And then you go into a different world that we don't normally see. You know, I used to be a scuba diver, but I started losing hearing in my left ear. It just wouldn't equalize uh, as quickly as my right ear. So I was always battling that. And I finally thought, you know, I've I've seen enough of the ocean's bottom and enough of the creepy things swimming around in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I loved that. That was a wonderful sport. And, you know, to be on the water and to be in a warm climate and the scuba dive, it's wonderful. You know, but other vacations you can take are what, are, what I call mental vacations. Since the mind can't tell the difference between what is real or what is well imagined, I always suggest to people that you imagine going to the lake, imagine going to the beach, going to the park, or, you know, I play my best round of golf in my mind. I'm hitting them straight down the fairway. My approach shots are sticking on the green. I'm putting like a madman, but I can enjoy and get the benefit of relieving the stress without the inconvenience of going there because I can just vividly imagine it blood pressure will drop, heart rate will slow. So mental vacations are great too. It only takes a few minutes. So a friend of mine uh, who's a psychologist said that you can anchor in, uh, I call it good juju, those moments when you're feeling sort of invincible and elated. And he said, all you have to do is just hold your thumbs when you get that wash of, of excitement and pride, just that good stuff, just anchor it in with something physical and then on a really hard, bad day, when you're feeling overwhelmed or whatever it is, you can actually trigger the brain by doing that physical thing again. And it can release those endorphins and kind of take you back to that moment. So what a great uh, strategy. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. So our audience is erupting. Uh, first of all, most important message for you this morning, Kit. You have a fellow 4 her Sarah Manley. And she said, we get things done. <laughs> what was the name of her 4-H club? Mine was the Rosendale Skippers. Ooh, 
Ooh, Sarah, what was the name of your 4-H club? Now, I was really jealous because I wanted to be in 4-H. I rode horses, but my mother was, I was the fifth kid. She was tired of driving people around. So 4-H was not an option for me, unfortunately. But um, so Sarah, let's see what she comes through with. I don't know yet. But uh, so you know what? where I grew up in rural Minnesota, uh, nine years old, I sometimes took my go-kart to the 4-H meetings or else the dirt bike. So back in the old days, we used to be able to get around out in the country roads and gravel roads pretty easily if you had, well, a bicycle too would work. But, you know, we were talking earlier, Kat, what a difference when we were growing up. You might, you know, do chores in the morning. You had pretty much the rest of the day off unless you're grinding feet and hauling manure. And then, you know, on a dairy farm to come back in the evening too. But we had, a, you know, in an odd sort of way, a lot of independent free time. And I think we need to also get, I call that quality time now when we take a look at stress management. Now, you remember, you know, six months ago, we used to starve for quality time with our family. And now because of the pandemic and stay at home orders, we've been around our family quite a bit, you know, yes. and so, uh, quality time sometimes need to change. Now, back in uh, my the hobby my wife and I had was buying old houses and fixing them up. And uh, my, uh, I guess, quality time or escape time was to go up to the second floor bathroom where there's a big old clawfoot tub full of piping hot peaches and cream bubble bath. And I'd slip in there for 20 minutes and relax, pull the plug, fight the current, shower off, you know, get a little more <laughs> exercise in and away I go. Today, though, in the home we live in, you know, it's a hot tub in the backyard. And if I've had a real bad day, I hardly break stride going through the house and into the hot tub and just one round, you know, I feel 10 years younger. So yeah. quality time might be time for you to just idle down, you know, just to relax and maybe a certain amount of silence or soft music that can really help to take away some of that stress. Yeah, absolutely. Just unplugging, getting away. Um, so Rick said, uh, Kit is so relatable and knowledgeable. Uh, he has been one of your best guest speakers. And Kit, I've had 97 guests wow. since COVID hit. So thank you for that, Rick. I agree. I've been so excited for the last two weeks about this morning. Um, and and he says that I've had some outstanding ones. So uh, Seneca great. loves your phrase that mental vacations are great too. <laughs> you know, and if you study the greats, which you've done for years, if you just go and watch movies or read books about the most successful people in the world, they all have strategies around stress management. They all take mental vacations. They all visualize success like that great golf game or Olympic athletes they'd go through visualizations of them acing that race down the, down that hill. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and that kind of alludes to other strategies too, that I call psychological strategies. One's, you know, is the contingency plans. You know, if you are able to manage your stress, you're able to make better decisions. You can be more creative. You're not in that, you know, looking most critical, vulnerable uh, weaknesses, you know, and that fight or flight response, but you can be more open to new ideas and new so, I, you know, maybe the old thing they used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Now, those are civet cats. So those weren't house cats. But when I was in New Orleans, they said, no, those are those are catfish. Well, OK, but there's more than one way to solve a problem. And so when it comes to contingency plans, don't hang your heart in one solution to the problem. Always have a handful of other ideas you're willing to accept that, you know, you can live with. And then also, you know, I find with some of the most successful people that I've read about, they they volunteer. They have philanthropy is part of their lifestyle to yeah. give away what's a luxury to them, to other people that really need it. And I, I don't know anything more stress relieving than that. One of the fun little techniques I suggest to people also is to give yourself a nickname that you like, not the nickname other people have given you. Uh, give yourself a nickname that you like. Now, my nickname for me is Welchy. I don't know what it is, but whenever I say uh, come on, Welchie, let's go. It gives me this little psychological pick me up. And I never realized how powerful this technique was until the first time I worked with the Department of Corrections. And I was giving a presentation on change and they didn't want any. And I was going to the front of the room. There were 400 correctional officers in the audience. And I'm saying to myself, come on, Welchie, let's go. Come on, Welchie, let's go. So if the presentation stunk, well, that was Welchie's fault, not mine. You know, but oh. I, I'm not suggesting you should have a split personality, but it, it, you can really manage a lot of stress if you do. Uh, but uh, have a little nickname that you give yourself that because we have tough decisions we have to make. But there's always an opportunity cost uh, as we go through. I can do this, but if I do that, I won't be able to do this. And, and sometimes we have to have those tougher conversations with people we love and care about. But if you just give yourself a little psychological boost with a little nickname, you, you make the call, you, you, you schedule the meeting, you have the conversation. And, you know, 
life is tough enough. And I, I this is really where I kind of end up with on the psychological remedies. You know, it kind of, some of it comes down to self-concept and self-esteem. And the bottom line is this, we spend 24 hours a day with ourselves. We could just as well enjoy it. <laughs> You're the only person you spend your entire life with, you know, be kind to yourself, be nice to yourself and, and to make sure that you remind yourself of all your strengths. One of the things I recommend to people is to put together a past accomplishments reference of at least 25 past accomplishments from when you're a little bitty snot nosed kid till now. Any award, certificate, plaque, trophy, ribbon, acts of kindness, but get it on a single list. Now you don't put that list out in front of your outside your office and people have to read it to see how cool you are and then you'll talk to them. It's a list just for your eyes only. But the next time you face a challenge or an obstacle at work or in your personal life, you pull out that past accomplishments reference that has 25 success stories where you are the hero or heroine in every one of them, you'll see this is just an opportunity to get something else on that list. Now, when I gave seminars on self-esteem, now I've changed that seminar to resiliency because of the pandemic. But uh, I used to ask people, you know, you had to fill that out before you could leave that seminar. And I'd stand at the door. Can I see your past accomplishments reference? And, you know, I'd bump into those people years later and they say, Kit, I'm up to 125. I'm up to 175. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Those past accomplishments, references, things would happen in my life and I'd add them to the list. Or I'd recall things that happened in the past that, you know, I was pretty proud of. Or that was a lot of hard work and that was a, a great accomplishment. And they just kept and they weren't arrogant. They weren't conceited. It just seemed like they're full of life. And I think if we can do a little self-care as we're going through the stressful time and any tool we can use. Uh, yesterday, I was giving a virtual presentation and somebody asked a question about difficult people. And I said to them, you know, this is what I, you know, I give seminars on handling difficult people. And I said, every once in a while, ugh, you know, one of them will get under my skin and, you know, and I don't want to drag that negative episode into other relationships that are innocent. So I said to them, this is my survival kit. I have this little story in the back of my Franklin planner that's about the frog and the scorpion, where the frog was gonna swim across the river and the scorpion says, can I have a ride? And the frog says, no, because I know you, when we get safely to the other side, you'll sting me and I'll die. And the scorpion said, no, I would never do that. Sure enough, get to the other side of the bank, stings the frog, frog's dying, says, why did you do that? I'm a scorpion, that's what I do. And I go, ah, that's what I had. That was a person was a scorpion, of course, that's what they do. Then I have a list of things that I'm thankful for. Then I have uh, my favorite picture of me. Look at this guy. Well, I guess I was getting, my brother bought a ski boat. This is like 20 years ago. I'm getting, look at that guy. He wouldn't care what anybody said. So <laughs> I myself with that. Then I have a list of things I love to do. And if I can do one of those, I do it right away. And then I love this thing. I love this. So I don't, I can't remember where I found this. It says in Casablanca, Peter Lore asks Humphrey Bogart if he despises him. And Bogart says, if I gave you any thought, I probably would. Ah, I love that. So when I have to deal with difficult people, I work with about 20,000 people a year, 1% of the population, ruthless. So I get about 200 of these a year. That's my survival kit. I have that in place. So I don't drag it into my next phone call. I don't drag it into my home. I take care of that negative episode where it happened. Oh, I love that. You got to have a survival kit and you got to make sure you carry it with you. Oh my goodness. So Kit, I'm scribbling notes. So many wonderful ideas. Um, as you talk about that list of past accomplishments, uh, I do a talk called the inner critic uh, knockdown. And uh, that's one of the exercises that I go through. And like you, everything I teach is stuff I'm battling with on a daily basis. So you actually, you literally do have a list of 30 tips on stress management. And you're offering that as a free download for everybody today. So Stefan, if you don't mind sharing that in the chat, that would be great. Uh, there it is, yeah, pop it up on the screen. And they can also go to my my website, seminarsonstress.com and download that uh, list also there. So I, um, let's talk about your website. So Seminars on Stress, you can go to Seminars on Stress. You can find out everything about Kit. He is busy as a speaker, but he is available. He's got some fantastic talks that are just like this, only even more high powered because you'll get more of him. So if you lead teams, if you lead groups in your community, call him, bring him in. Um, as he said, he'd never done online stuff, but he's been doing it now for six months. And as you can tell, he's a master. So you can pipe him into your offices, into people's living rooms and let him get in there and help people manage these difficult times because this is not a sprint. 
This is a marathon. We have months. And for some people, there are going to be years, as you said, of this being a tough time, a slump. So down, get his free download and then call whoever you can to bring him in to ignite your teams, to lift you up and give you some really bite-sized strategies that you can use to, to get through this tough time. Um, Kate, we've got one more really important question. Okay. Does swearing really help? <laughs> you know, it does. The key is to make sure you don't do it where there's people around you that would have an impact on your future, you know, because, uh, <laughs> but it is a release. It is almost like a pressure release valve on a water heater. You've had it up to here, can you let it out? But I'd like you to do it somewhere privately so you don't have to apologize to people for your language or your conduct. One other uh, tool that I'd like to share, Kat, is uh, I do have a, a YouTube channel called Seminars on Stress also. And on there, there's uh, about 50 videos where it's myself and also a struggling image of me. And it's a little uh, conversation I have with myself. So uh, it's an image of me <laughs> that is, uh, I call him the goofy guy, that is struggling with a stress management issue. And then in a couple of minutes, I try to help him. Sometimes he gets it, sometimes he doesn't, which is part of the fun. Uh, but there's about 50 of those videos on my YouTube channel called Seminars on Stress also that people can access for free. And they can download those. They can uh, show them at a, you know their meetings or if they want to incorporate it in a presentation. It, just use it. That's the most important part of the stress management techniques is to just use them and to share them because you know, stress is uh, affecting every one of us and, and we want to help everybody we can. And I'm on your mailing list too. So you send out some of your uh, your um, alter ego videos through your newsletter. How can they sign up for your newsletter? Oh, that's simple. You just go to my website and there's a little sign in there, just your email address and you'll start getting those. Yeah, They're, You know, I wanted to create something that would be fun for me to do and, you know, fun for people to watch. And, you know, I've also uh, kind of cleverly hidden some real content in there. So it is a valuable use of your time. It's just a couple of minutes, but yeah. it might be just what a person needs that day to, you know, one of my uh, clients uh, was watching one of those videos on a Saturday morning and his teenage son came by and he was half asleep and looked over, in, in, over his shoulder at the conversation I was having with myself. And he goes, those two guys look familiar. Are they, are they related? <laughs> and my client turns out and goes, it's the same guy. <laughs> and his son, son goes, no, it's not. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I have, sometimes I have a mustache. Sometimes I have glasses. I've changed my hair. I mean, it's kind of a silly, silly kind of a video blog. It but. is. But I was just going to say, before you said that, I, um, I was going to recommend that people share it with their kids because our kids, for those of you that have kids at home, my kids just went back to school this week at home. Um Kids need our help too, learning how to manage their stress. And it's really easy to dismiss it and say, ah, oh, they're just 14. They don't know what stress is. They actually do. And the sooner we can help them learn to manage it. And I think your videos are a great tool to, to help the kids learn to do that. So I've taken up a half an hour of your time. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dropping by this morning and sharing your wisdom and your wit. And uh, thank you to all of our viewers for joining. Please spread the word. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. This is a replay you can get this, you can share this with your friends and family um, on all of your social media networks. And uh, we hope you join you this Thursday. And Kit, thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. It's been a pleasure working with you.